All right, well, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon or morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Jason Milgram, and I'm going to be talking about cloud transformation, really from a kind of a strategic, a strategic and, and strategy standpoint. We're going to kind of walk through uh, a methodology on how to approach uh, cloud adoption and cloud transformation. Uh, my current role, I'm the uh, A Chief Architect at SEIC.com. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, I have their website up and running. Uh, our clients are uh, federal government agencies. Uh, we do things from mission to support, to IT technology, and a whole bunch of sub areas. Our clients are primary uh, DOD, uh, intelligence community, uh, NASA. Uh, so it's uh, definitely a lot of interesting uh, interesting projects. Um, uh, for me, the the uh, the presentation isn't in the full frame. Is it in your full frame? It uh, it shows it in the full frame. Uh, okay. Let's... I see the full frame. Maybe you're zoomed in, Dave. Okay. Very good. No problem. I was checking. Very good. Continue. Right. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, you know, feel free to ask questions or make statements throughout this. Uh, I've been working in the Azure space since 2010. Actually, I got involved in Azure before it uh, was GA, became generally available. Um, have really enjoyed working in the Azure space. Uh, the first, I'd say three years, not too many uh, companies really were that interested in Azure. So it was a lot of uh, talking and preaching to uh, kind of mildly interested crowds. Uh, and then something changed and Azure really started taking off. I think Microsoft has done an uh, amazing job over, uh, you know, I'm not sure the last five years, uh, really transforming Azure and uh, their security tools uh, running in the cloud. It's really been a fun platform to work on. Uh, you know, uh, for those who are not familiar with Azure, and I'm assuming most people are on the uh, call are, you know, it's Azure is just Microsoft's global data centers. Uh, it started with three services. Now they're over 140 services. So saying you work in Azure can be misleading because there are so many different areas that you can work in Azure. Everything's abstracted as a service, uh, you know, from DevOps to AI to databases, and the list goes on. Uh, it's an exciting place to work. Uh, to work in and highly advance, uh, suggest if you're looking for 10-year investments, just buy Microsoft stock. Well, Microsoft and Amazon. All right, so just to make sure everything's working, uh, did it advance to the next slide? Yes, everything's okay. working fine. Yeah. All right, so the cloud fundamentally changes how you know, we procure and use technology resources. So with the cloud, you can provision and consume resources only when needed. Uh, now, while the cloud offers tremendous flexibility and design choices, you really need a proven and consistent methodology for adopting cloud technologies. Now, my goal with this presentation is to provide you with a really kind of a holistic adoption strategy around business, people, and technology, so you can ensure you know, your organization is able to take full advantage of the cloud so you can meet your digital transformation goals. Now, digital transformation is thrown all around a lot. Uh, I think it means uh, how it's applied uh, can be very different, but it, in the end, you are doing some type of digital transformation. So uh, I kind of like it as a term. So we're going to discuss kind of very clear and actionable, actionable steps that you can take. Uh, Hopefully that will kind of help, uh, you know, deliver the desired business outcomes uh, that you need. So here we break the journey down into three steps, plan, ready, adopt. And these aren't Jason Milgram steps. These are Microsoft steps and how they uh, suggest you approach things at a very, very high level. Now, however, before your cloud journey can start, uh, you really need a business strategy and that needs to align with actionable technology projects that delivered uh, delivers on uh, desired business outcomes. 
So everyone says, okay, great. You know, everyone says, yeah, you have to have a strategy. So we're actually going to talk through what uh, could be or should be in the strategy. And I know this differs a lot between the size of the organization you're in and or the type of client you're working for. At the end of this kind of formalized process, we'll have another discussion on, you know, what happens when you're working with a client, or you're in a situation where no one quite want, wants to follow a formal methodology on how to doing uh, your cloud journey. Um, so we'll look at it from kind of two different sides. All right, so these steps really can help you document your business strategy efficiently. This approach helps drive the adoption efforts that capture the targeted business value in a cross-functional model. Now, these have really important meetings when you're dealing with large organizations. Uh, maybe there's multiple committees involved, but there are definitely multiple business units. And so we really should uh, you know, think about these four areas, the motivations, the business outcomes, the justifications, and then the first adoption project. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these steps a little bit more. But um, ideally, this will help you in that journey. Uh, we've probably all been in situations where, you know, we're told, I need you to lead us, lead this project or start, start us out. And kind of getting these things at least discussed and written down is going to make your life, uh, should make it uh, easier. All right, so organizations usually have uh, different triggers on why they're ready to adopt new technologies, like moving into the Azure cloud. Some of those triggers will drive the organization to migrate current applications. Other triggers require the creation of new capabilities or products and experiences. So it's important to review and understand your organization's motivations, as this does become key to developing a successful strategy. So on this slide, you can see some examples of motivations. Uh, I, one of my questions to, to you is, um, you know, what other motivations would you add to this from your experiences, either within your organization, a project, or maybe working with a client? Yeah, I guess maybe compliance. Customers want to get the servers out of their, their off-premises so they're not responsible in the same way. Yeah. Some And, uh, you know, and in two careers, two jobs ago on the consulting side, uh, sometimes we'd have clients, it's simply their hardware was old and they didn't want to, they were looking at the bill of buying, you know, new servers. And it's not just a machine, you know, these are kind of beefy machines, you know, with RAID and they're like, ah, you know, let's, let's look at this cloud thing. I hear we can like rent, rent it or something. Um, but yeah, there are lots of motivations. Uh, I think these are some pretty good, uh, you know, ones that we've uh, seen before, at least I've seen before. So once you start looking at the motivations, and there can be multiple motivations, uh, depending perhaps on the, across the business unit, you might have a different, in IT, a different viewpoint of what those motivations mean, as opposed to someone in sales or marketing. They might, their motivations maybe won't break it down into the IT side, of the equation, but collect all the motivations and you'll start to see they usually fall into one of two categories. Uh, and it's usually either migration or innovation. And that's a good way to start because what you're also doing by building out the strategy is kind of create a, a common, uh, well, documenting and creating a common mindset of what's being done and why and what the outcomes are. So. Collect the motivations. Um, now, if the highest, uh, sorry, um, when innovation, for, from looking at all the motivations that were collected, if innovation is the highest priority, uh, one area is um, really focusing on the planning efforts uh, because uh, Wait, I'm on the migration slide, right? 
Yes. 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 Okay. Um, because migration. Sorry, getting a uh, screen confused here. So you have to start the the planning efforts now. Migra migration requires uh, a growth mindset and. The important thing is a willingness to iteratively improve the processes based on the lessons that you learned. So why? Well, we all know that uh, not, usually nothing ever goes exactly to plan. Uh, and migrations are kind of like that. If you haven't done them before or done enough of them, you know, you might be planning one and you've read the documentation and you say, OK, this, this seems all pretty straightforward. But obviously you want to start with a proof of concept, start small. Learn from that. Don't start big. Uh, plan big, but move forward forward iteratively and improve the processes as you do. Because I guarantee, you, as you start doing the migrations, there's going to be stuff you learned or something that you didn't think about. Um, whether it's dependencies between machines, or just not having been familiar with the particular migration tool. Now, of course, with Azure, there's a number of migration tools available. Um, but you know, plan big, but move forward small and iteratively. And on this screen, you can see uh, you know typical migration uh, motivations. All right, so when innovation is the highest priority, uh, planning again is required, but some of this is going to be more geared toward uh, investment. Now, it's important that when you're doing innovation planning that you're kind of balancing out the IT portfolio and aligning the investment side made during this cloud adoption. Now, the investment side means time and money, and it definitely has a higher profile when you're doing kind of innovation transformation as opposed to migration. People look at it differently. Migration is um, it's not it's far less abstract. You have this. We need to migrate it. Uh, OK, things change. Uh, time slips, but you still have to move it on the innovation side. You know, there could be budgets for multiple innovation projects, so you know, time and money just definitely has a higher profile on innovation than it does with migration. Of course, they're absolutely important for both, but just you want to spend more time thinking about uh, the financial side of any uh, of uh, any innovation project. And again, on this slide here, just examples of you know some of the different motivations for innovation projects. And actually, as a quick side note, uh, has anyone been recently, let's say in the last year, involved in a migration to Azure project or uh, in an innovation project in Azure? Mm, hosting things up on Azure. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah, I was involved with one with my last client. They moved their entire their data center was all, all old hardware. They needed to get it up to date, and that was their plan. OK, motivation. All right, so motivation was. Uh, we don't want to invest in new hardware. Correct. OK. Anyone else? Care to share? Uh, not me specifically, but my company is moving a lot of things into Azure. OK. Well, I highly recommend Azure. It's, it's a great place. Uh, but you know, honestly, um, you know whether it's Azure or Amazon, you know they're both excellent choices. Uh, I'm certainly biased to Azure simply because I've been working in the space for a very long time. But you know, I've just been hugely impressed with the uh, with the advancements and strides that have have been made over. Uh, so, over so the years. Jason, so Jason, I, I was we were having a discussion about Azure versus AWS, and. Uh, and uh, when, so my viewpoint, of course, is that uh, Azure is, you know, better for developers and that IT people seem to like AWS better. 
but uh, other people think exactly the opposite. So do you have any opinions? We just like it all better. Um, you know, I, I think some of it is tied to, you know, AWS had a had a head start. Um, and I remember when they just came out with, uh, you know, their EC2 instances and the S3 storage, you know, and, and when it first came out, no one was using the marketing term cloud widely yet. In fact, it really wasn't used that much on the Amazon side. But, uh, you know, we were a, a big uh, a AWS user. Um, we'd spun up uh, quite a few VMs. We're actually running uh, Lotus Notes Domino on VMs in Amazon. Uh, right. One project had 10 of them running. Um, so I think part of it is just having kind of uh, grown a strong presence in the space first. Um, and, you know, having been not Microsoft, because they're, you know, for a while, Microsoft really had they had done too much head-to-head -head bashing, uh, you know, a decade ago, 15 years ago, or, or yeah. more. I have to look There's at the a years. Lot, and, a lot of Linux and Unix people, they still hate Microsoft. Yeah, there was there was a lot of animosity. And, uh, you know, for my career from 90, 1993 to 2006, you know, I was on the IBM tech side. And I really didn't like how they did a number of things. So I think there was a lot of kind of residual from that. Um, but, you know, back in the beginning of cloud, you, you had AWS and you had Rackspace and the two of them were killing it. You know, Microsoft came out with Azure and they did not have virtual machines. They had uh, uh, storage, which was very, very similar to S3. They had platform as a service and they had Azure SQL. Those were the three services. Uh, uh, services offered and platform as a service was a um, most very few people were looking for that yet but it was the next step and it's where people wanted to get to after they got used to cloud and and vms so in the beginning people looked at paths and like ah we we really just want a vm can we spin up a vm and it took Microsoft a while to actually get VMs into the offering. So to the short version uh, of that answer is, uh, I think AWS, uh, they had a head start. They had VMs when uh, Azure didn't, and there was still a lot of animosity left over. Uh, I would say now what's really nice is, uh, as apparently I'm getting older, uh, a lot of the people who were younger than me don't really have any history of that animosity. They just know there's AWS, there's Azure, uh, you know, there's Google. So they don't have the animosity. Um, and Microsoft has done, uh, I think, a tremendous job. Uh, you know, I've heard the term a number of times. You probably have two frenemies. You know, they had a leadership change. Uh, well, yeah, the whole company did a huge pivot over the last seven, eight years. Yeah, huge pivot pivot that's been very, very successful with them. We want you to be able to run anything and everything in Azure. It's good for Microsoft. It's good for their former competitors. They've made nice and friends with uh, a lot of people. So um, as far as which one's better, I, I think they're bro both great choices. I personally feel, um, you know, I think, in, you know, Azure has some superior offerings and you know perhaps what will happen with Amazon is AWS will break off from the retailer side uh, and you know I think that'll uh, you know help yep. set them up to uh, you know to continue to be uh, you know head-to-head -head competitors with uh, Microsoft Azure and, and that's actually important because of you know, uh, dynamic marketplaces. We want competitors because they keep each other fresh. They keep on adding features. They'll uh, help keep pricing in line. So, you know, free market economy is, uh, in this case, is a good thing. Yeah. All right. So, business outcomes. We talked about uh, motivations. So, 
successful transformation transformation journeys they start with a business outcome in mind and cloud adoption can be costly and to, and uh, time consuming effort so fostering the right level of support uh, not just from IT, but other areas of the business is crucial to success. Uh, your goal has to be able to identify business outcomes that are concise and defined and will drive observable results or change in the business performance that's uh, supported by specific measures. Um, so during any cloud transformation, you know, the ability to speak in terms of business outcomes uh, really will help support transparency and the cross-functional partnerships. Now, by cross-functional, you know if you uh, if you're not used to that term, you have to think about the business, uh, not just about the IT department. You know, you have to get engaged in conversations, perhaps with uh, financial leadership, with marketing, with sales, with human resources. They all end up having a role. So, on financial leadership side. You know, perhaps this is about uh, increasing profitability while driving compliance, as an example. With marketing, maybe it's to acquire and retain customers or build reputation. For sales, accelerate sales, improve customer lifetime value. For human resources, you know, they have to retain existing folks. They have to perhaps recruit new ones uh, because you need new skill sets. Uh, you have to they have to help empower the employees offer training so existing employees can train up and be part of this so can't just be an IT silo you have to break out and have these conversations across the organization uh, that's what we mean by talking about cross-functional partnerships um, you definitely have to have uh, support from other parts of the organization All right, so speaking in business outcomes can feel like a foreign language to many technically minded individuals. So here's a list of typical business outcomes you can use and talking about uh, business outcomes tends to help drive the consensus building uh, conversations again across the business units. So with fiscal outcomes, you know, it's financial or fiscal performance is probably the cleanest business outcome uh, for many business leaders. It's not the only one, but it can be very clear and concise. You know, this is, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, and the financials uh, really help drive a very clean and specific conversation. It's not the only one because with agility, you know, fast changing business environments, there's a huge emphasis on time. So the ability to respond to and drive market change quickly is a fundamental a fundamental measure of business agility and you know as we've moved through decades people said yeah yeah we have to be able to adopt to mac uh to uh to market changes but we've seen that uh the ability to adopt faster has become very critical because the amount of time that businesses have had to react to change um has gotten a lot shorter than it was, let's say, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. So agility outcome is is a real thing and of critical importance, uh, or it should be to, uh, to your C-level folks. Um, reach outcomes. Um, so constantly shrinking markets, you know, global reach or ability to support global customers and users. Uh, you know, can also be measured by compliance and geogra uh, geographies that are relevant to the business. Maybe you're doing business in North America. So depending on what you're doing, you know, there are different data rules in Canada than there are in the US, you know, or in Europe. So reach um, can be about going after larger markets, different markets, but also being able to support markets uh, with different compliance requirements. Customer engagement outcomes. Social marketplaces are completely have been redefining winners and losers at an unheard of pace. Uh, you know, um, I'm trying to remember the app. Uh, is it Rotten Tomatoes? There's a couple of them. Um, you know, there was one year I read an article that Hollywood was really angry 
because they found a direct correlation to movie revenue, box off, box office revenue in Rotten Tomatoes, uh, and then other apps that use the data from Rotten Tomatoes, because you know pretty much there was wasn't a consolid way of getting mass feedback on movies, and people were now coming up with rules about, well, we'll only go to see a movie in the theater if you know, critics and audience both are 80 percent or higher. Um, so that impacted uh, movie going. Um, people looking at reviews on Amazon. So customer engagement outcomes, hugely important. Uh, performance outcomes, performance re re and re reliability are assumed, but if either falters, definitely can have reputation damage and that can be painful and long lasting. Uh, outages, um, so performance out uh, performance outcomes are important and real. Uh, so each of those outcomes really can also help you uh, uh, in the conversation with the other uh, with the other business units as well as your technical team members. Um, however, you shouldn't just limit yourself to these examples. Understanding kind of the unique needs of your business and building the outcomes that match that and maximize the will help you really maximize the value of the cloud transformation. So these are all great basic starting points. They're critical, they're real, but if you're able to expand on any of these and make them more specific to your organization, that'll definitely help. All right, so we talked about motivations. I'm sorry, outcomes, motivations, outcomes, uh, business justifications. This is a, a single slide. It's it's pretty uh, basic, but hugely important. Um, cloud transformation projects can generate early return on investment, uh, but developing a clear justification with tangible relevant costs and returns can be complex. Uh, for that, um, again, conversations across the organization, but also working with uh, you know, architects who are experienced in that particular cloud area are really able to help kind of build out, do the cost calculator, put in all the different pieces. Um, someone who's, you know, just getting started, you know, they'll put in some, but they perhaps they may not know the others. Um, so at the highest level, the formula for business justification is very simple. The return on investment. Um, however, kind of the subtle data points required to populate the formula can be difficult to align. Um, so it's it's a challenge, but it certainly can be reached. But business justifications uh, are important in any cloud. Uh, transformation project. All right, so there's a learning curve and a time commitment associated with cloud adoption planning. So even for experienced teams, proper planning takes time, time to align the stakeholders, time to collect and analyze the data, time to validate long term decisions and time to align people, the processes and the technology. So with all that said, your first cloud adoption project should align with your motivations for the project. And whenever possible, uh, it should demonstrate progress toward a defined business outcome. Oh, hey, Jason, what's a, when you say defined business outcome, would that be you know, something like reduce uh, CapEx by 50% or something like that? Or would it be um, a higher higher um, reliability of an application or something? It can be both of those. So outcome, uh, the the top one is always fiscal, uh, fiscal yeah. outcome. Um, very clear, speaks loudly and clearly to, uh, you know, C-level uh, and decision makers in the organization. But it's not the only one. I mean, performance, absolutely reliability. You know, as long as you can capture it, and there might be multiple outcomes, but you can also maybe put them in a priority or you might find that, you know, here's a list of five outcomes, but, you know, 
this business unit really is only concerned about this one. But having these written out, being able to make it relatable to, you know, across the organization and to the decision makers is hugely important. Okay. I didn't mean to drag you back, but. No, no, that's fine. Um, Jason, yeah. I, I got a question on the ROI slide as well. Okay. Uh, did I write it wrong? No, no, it looks it looks good. <laughs> um, my, my question is, uh, usually an ROI is over a, a period of time, say like three to five years or whatever. And I'm just curious from your experiences, what what is a, a target ROI that people are looking for? Like 10% over a year or 20% over three years or what? I, I'd have to say it's probably been different with uh, when I was on the consulting side very different with different clients some of them were wanting to know what uh you know over three months some of them a year some are were three years um i guess it, it really depends but if you can quantify it and map it out so they can understand um and then kind of even take it and run with it to to take it even further um but unfortunately, the answer to that is, uh, you know, the, the famous I, a famous IT answer of it depends. I, I know. I, I guess in my experience, people look like a, want like a hundred percent ROI, say in like five years or something like that. So that might be twenty percent per year. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in some types of projects, uh, and this is what I'm seeing in uh, larger federal projects you actually can collect the data and there's enough there to, to, to show, to, to more reliably show five years. I think it, a lot of depends on the size of the client and kind of the, maybe the potential impact that the project's gonna have. Um, some of them could be very straightforward. It could just be a, in part a licensing issue. Hey, we have all these on-prem enterprise SQL servers uh, and you know, enterprise SQL on-prem licenses are, are can be very very pricey you know with the number of cpus and for that that that's an easy one you can show them well move it into the cloud and you know azure sql let's try replicated you're not paying for enterprise but you're kind of getting it um, definitely some of them are easy more easy to, to figure out than others and maybe we can talk more about some of those projects uh toward the end, because after this methodology, we'll talk about kind of the other side of when people are like, no, 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 we need to take shortcuts. OK, thanks. Yep. Um, so first project and kind of what's also being presented here is uh, sometimes this is absolutely required from the client or the company that you're working with. I mean, this is how it is done. Um, and others, you know, they're, you know, let's just get it done. You know, I don't want to know, just get it done. Um, but if you're doing your first uh, adoption project, it's really important to make sure they understand that not only is this our first adoption project, but this is going to be a source of learning for the team. You really want to help prepare some, some uh, either decision makers or people who are trying to put metrics around the success of the project, make sure they understand that. Um, and also help them understand that it, it could take, you know, there could, might be additional efforts required, again, because it's the first one. Um, and that actually doing this project will help you come up with kind of more detailed requirements that allow you to create a more detailed plan um, but having those conversations, getting people aligned and understanding these different sides of it are, are important. Uh, first example projects, there can be all kinds. Um, you know, business continuity and disaster recovery, always a big one, uh, especially in South Florida with hurricanes. Um, th that's usually an easy discussion. It's, it's simple to understand. Uh, maybe uh, deploy a non-production instance of a workload into the cloud. Um, archiving, you know, cold storage can place, a, you know, a stain, a strain on your on-prem resources. And on-prem means either in your office or 
in many cases it means in a rack in a data center that you're renting. But um, yeah, cold storage is, takes up space, costs money. Uh, moving that to the cloud could end up being a very solid and quick win for you. Uh, end of support. Migrating assets that have reached the end of support is another quick win that builds technical skills, and it could also provide some cost avoidance from expensive support contracts or licensing costs you know, that you're, you're going to have to sign. Uh, virtual desktops, creating virtual desktops for remote employees can also be a quick win. And in some cases, uh, you know, as a first uh, cloud adoption project could also reduce uh, dependence on expensive private networks in favor of, you know, public internet connectivity. Dev test, another easy conversation. Remove dev test from on premises environments. Give developers control and agility and. Self service capabilities. Uh, simple apps modernize migrate. Um, you know, turning uh, maybe a traditional web app with a, a back end database. Um, putting into PaaS and moving to Azure SQL. Um, you know, the small ones uh, sometimes can be very, very easy to migrate, take very little time and also can be kind of a, a learning, uh, a source of learning. Performance labs, um, you know, be able to quickly and cost effectively provision labs in short amounts of time. Uh, if that's something that you as an organization do or you're, you have clients, um, data platform that's uh, you know all of these have had kind of trends uh, and I've seen kind of you know certain some spike up more uh, they're all you know current and relevant uh, I've seen a lot of data platform in the last couple of years um, you know whether it's uh, data warehouse or data lake and getting into the analytics side and showing people that they can have 24 7 access to reports dashboards and reports that you create in Power BI so that a decision maker doesn't have to, you know, create a request and send it to have a special report created. You know, if, you know, with Power BI, you can make it so they can dynamically click on different things and kind of get to answers they're looking for. Um, that also can have huge visibility and, you know, things like that all of a sudden, every all of a sudden everyone wants stuff built for them. Just keep in mind the first project, it serves as a great learning opportunity for everyone involved, including your stakeholders. Uh, but again, start with try and start with something simple that will result in a clear win. So we spent a bit of time on strategy um, and that's been intentional because you do need to have a well-defined strategy. Everyone says, oh, you know, make sure you come up with a strategy so we kind of walk through, hey, here's a uh, in concept, an easy way to come up, come up, come up and write out a strategy. Um, and ultimately that should save you uh, resources, time and money by doing that kind of work, having those conversations up front, creating common understandings on the motivations, the outcomes, the justifications. So now we talk about the plan ready and adopt and. Uh, planning. Um, so. You rationalize your digital estate and you create your cloud. Uh, adoption plan. You've probably heard this before. You've probably seen it before. So what does it mean? Well, when they say rationalize your digital estate. Uh, the idea is that you kind of have to understand your organization's current digital estate. Uh, and estate means kind of everything. Uh, understand what the current digital estate is, what is what the organization has, and this can help you potentially maximize the return and minimize risks. Uh, and you can in part do that by running workload assessments uh, with creating the adoption plan. You know, it's creating a plan where you kind of prioritized workloads and you defined and aligned those with business outcomes. Now that does require a little uh, expansion. Um, OK, 
Can you guys still see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Rationalize your digital estate. OK, I'm having uh, some type of. Uh, issue. It just went blank. Um, yeah, I, my other, I had to change laptops recently because to my Surface Book because the, my other laptop when I ran Zoom after about 15 minutes, the, the laptop screen would go blank. OK, the external monitor was OK. But teams didn't usually do it. Did yeah, the whole I'm, screen, the whole screen go blank. I'm restarting PowerPoint. Uh, all of a sudden, it just had outlines. Hmm. Um, so, where were we? If you turn off your Bitcoin miner. <laughs> uh, you know, luckily, I I sold all my cryptocurrency just when COVID was taken off. Um, all right, so let me uh, let me reshare screen one. All righty. Slideshow current swap. Got it. OK, and everything's I think somehow PowerPoint. I don't know. I've been getting a uh, every like uh, two weeks an update to my uh, my graphics card. Anyway, so rationalize digitaling the state. Um, digital state collection of all IT assets that power the business processes and supporting operations. Um, you evaluate the assets and determine the best way to migrate or modernize each component to the cloud. And this is often called the five R's uh, rehost, refactor, rearchitect, rebuild, or new and replace. So with rehost, it's also known as lift and shift migration. Uh, a rehost effort moves a current state asset to the chosen cloud provider, minimum change to overall architecture. That's going to become important to our conversation after the methodology of people who just say, just get stuff done. Um, now, refactor is when you say, OK, we want to uh, refactor the code to allow the uh, application to deliver on new business opportunities, uh, experience fatter and faster and shorter updates, benefit from code portability, achieve greater cloud efficiency. Um, Rehost is relatively easy, not par particularly expensive. It has kind of a very, it's e not too hard to calculate how much that will cost. Refactoring, you know, the bill starts to go up. Uh, Rearchitect, the bill gets even bigger. And um, but it's really a good, especially if you are able to move toward uh, to microservices or you're going to Kubernetes or you're going to um, Azure Service Fabric. Uh, huge benefits there, but it's not an inexpensive resource change. But rearchitecting can be hugely beneficial. Uh, microservices, Kubernetes, Azure Service Fabric, a lot of great reasons to do it. Depending on the size of application, that could be a, a a bigger project than you realize. If you're able to start something with something small, that could be great too. Uh, rebuild something or just do something new. You had something; it's now unsupported. It's not aligned anymore. It's just so out of date. Doesn't make sense to sense to carry it forward. Um, just start with new uh, new cloud uh, native design. And then simply replace. Sometimes the best approach is uh, just replace the current application with something that's hosted. Uh, it's running as a service. Uh, there are a lot of solutions out there, and perhaps you can save resources by simply switching to to one of those. But the whole point is, you need to rationalize your digital estate to understand to, for everything in it. 
you know, maybe assign one of the R's to it. What are we going to do with this one? Ah, this, that's an easy one. We're going to replace it because they're such they're services. They don't cost that much that do all this. It'll release all this burden and support from us, and it provides these features that we just don't have. Uh, Rehost, yep, we're just going to migrate it up to the cloud. This one, we really we want to re-architect it. Uh, after we've done the analysis, it's not in the budget, but you know, perhaps we can, if we plan now, we can get budgeted for the next fiscal year. So assess your estate, assign one of the R's to it. Now the adoption plan, you know, here, develop a business justification, uh, you know, identify the business outcomes, uh, map to maybe the specific capabilities that you're able to bring about, um, what business strategies you can uh, can be reached uh, from this transformation and documenting all these uh, outcomes and strategies. Uh, that's really, once you've done the strategy uh, where we spent most of the time in, a lot of these other things fall into place. Um, back uh, in my IBM days, when I went through kind of the formalized rational training um you know they would say that you would spend uh, a th on a project you know the amount of time you spent on the strategy and the kind of pre-architecture side where you didn't write any code um, would usually represent a third of the time total time you did on the project if you did it right and that third was going to save you a lot of money in those next two thirds when, when it came time to implement. It really is carried forward, you know, from rational to CMMI to to uh, to agile to scrum, you know, all those things uh, are still applicable. Uh, the methodology we, we methodologies we learn now, you learn much quicker. Um, those perhaps I think less time spent on them. Interesting fact, uh, the software engineering methodologies, at least as it was explained to me and from what I've read, uh, were really kind of initially built off of traditional construction um, uh, methodologies because, you know, the engineering of buildings and skyscrapers and sewer systems and bridges, you know, construction had, had been around for 2,000 years or more. Uh, and had grown tremendously on the processes and procedures to build something so it wouldn't fall apart. So when they started building these out for software development, um, companies like IBM uh, and others, you know, looked back on, you know, the methodologies that were built around the construction industry and f saw how they could apply them to software. Just interesting factoid, which I think is correct. All right, uh, the last point, ready. Um, you know, you looked at uh, the business plan, aligned it to the digital state rationalization. Um, you know, your cloud adoption is a, it's a strategic change and involves in both uh, involvement from decision makers and end users. Uh, and now you have to get ready for the actual journey. So, you know, define skills and support readiness. That's important because here you actually have to create and implement a skills readiness plan because you have to figure out, are there gaps? Do we need to address uh, uh, skill set gaps? Uh, do we need to ensure that our current people, IT staff, and maybe people in other business units are ready for the change in the new technologies? And that's not always an easy thing. Um, you know, maybe you uh, are you working with the existing IT staff. There are new skills, but this is also a change for, you know, the people not in IT. And people can be very fickle when it comes to something changes. So you need to allow like the proper amount of time to have those conversations, share stuff. You know, uh, end users hate being surprised. Um, Define the support needs. Help desk hates being surprised. <laughs> um, that's what uh, defining skills and support readiness means. And then 
create the landing zone. So the landing zone um, is the term it's used to describe the environment that's provisioned and uh, prepared uh, for the workloads. So a functional landing zone is the final uh, deliverable. And if you work in an area of uh, it's under a lot of areas of compliance, um, there's something also called ATO authority to operate, you know, preparing that landing zone with the authority to operate, meaning it now meets the uh, compliance requirements that you are required to, in some cases by law, to meet. Um, also very important. All right, so kind of the last one, adopt. Um, this is when you kind of put everything into motion. So you, you establish the justifications, the outcomes, you've prepared your organization, you've prepared your people, you've impaired, prepared the cloud environment and are ready to deploy you know, the prioritized workload, workloads that you identified during your estate um, review. You're ready to adopt the technologies. Uh, and um, this is where it all converges, the whether it's a migration or innovation. I guess uh, with again migration, you know, it's just the moving existing digital assets to, uh, to Azure. Uh, the existing assets can be replicated to the cloud, usually with minimum modifications. Uh, after you, uh, the application or workload becomes operational in the cloud, you know, then you transition the users from the existing solution to the cloud solution. With cloud innovation, um, cloud native apps and data can accelerate development and experimentation cycles. Uh, older apps can also take advantage of many of the same uh, can take advantage of many of the same uh, cloud native benefits by modernizing the solution or components. Uh, modern DevOps uh, and software development lifecycle approaches uh, can also uh, shorten the time from idea to product uh, transformation. Combined, you can use these tools to create shorter feedback loops and better customer experiences. Uh, big focus on DevOps. Um, as you've probably heard, it's not just the tools, but it's kind of the culture that you have to build. You know, you could also look if you're starting a transformation journey by going through this whole process. Um, you could then all relate all these different steps uh, and the cross-functional involvement into a DevOps process because all of these really kind of tie into that. All right, so um, we spent a lot of time to, talking about how to define the strategy, the planning, the ready, adopt. Uh, I do have an example of a hybrid migration. Uh, and then I did want to talk about for the cases where uh, people don't want to follow methodologies um, or you don't have really enough time to come up with one. So business story around this. Um, this was a distributor of both um, a business to business uh, scenario. They are a distributor to other businesses, nutritional supplements as well as prescription medication. They had the front end web servers. BE stands for back end, the back end servers uh, complex built out over 12 years by eight different teams. Some of them never even kind of knew each other. You just kind of find artifacts of, by comments in the code. Uh, areas of compliance with a prescription medication. Uh, they wanted to get it off of on premise, but they were also concerned about security and compliance. Um, they didn't want to, you know, try to do everything. They needed to get a relatively quick and easy win to show benefits. Um, now, another interesting part of this 
uh, use case is this was business to business and most of the businesses uh, when they would sign contracts for supplements or medication were doing these on you know recurring contracts uh, that would come up to expire so usually people would hit the website during the last week of the month um, that's when their loads would always spike during the first three weeks there's really not much that activity so challenges here uh, if they had any outages, uh, they were losing money, especially during that fourth week. Um, predicting demand, scaling, again, all on premise uh, was not easy for them to do. Uh, people would have get paged because there was an alert and a log at uh, 2 a.m. and that had to get fixed. So how the system worked, people would come and uh, submit a request through the web server that would get submitted to the back end. The back end would send an email saying we've received your request, blah, 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 blah. Um, it is being processed. Now the back end would have to do, depending on what was ordered, compliance checks. Uh, did the requesting business still have the license to have these types of prescription medications? Um, were certain documents on file, were certain things updated with the state registry. Uh, complex process again built out over a long period of time. Once everything checked out, a shipment was created and a tracking order was sent for the actual supplies. So for this, and again, think about business uh, motivation. What's the business outcome? Uh, justification. So cloud transformation replicated the database to the cloud and moved the web app to the cloud. They kept the backend server on-prem. They were very concerned about security and compliance. They didn't want to move it to the cloud. Backend certainly needed to be re-architected, but that's a long expensive project um, that would you know, time and money. The web app, the front end, wasn't particularly hard to move up into the cloud. They could, as a PaaS service, take advantage of uh, scaling up and scaling out as uh, as the needs uh, grew, especially during week four. What that also allowed them to do is on those other weeks, they could scale way down. They didn't have to have that many instances just during uh, peak time. So they were able to take, a, take advantage of disposable computing. System work the same. Go to the website, submit your order. Backend would process everything. Once everything was cleared, you get your tracking notification. So again, think about uh, the different areas that we talked about for planning this. Um, and the other was, uh, you know, the pain that was solved by this because it was the IT department. Anytime there was a problem with uh, the web server on premise or not being able to scale up for, you know, who knew that, you know, all of a sudden everyone would start be ordering this because of something that occurred, uh, whether an actual, um, you know, illness like COVID or, uh, you know, when the case of this use case, you know, people all of a sudden would talk about this particular remedy. Um, you know, on the supplement side, and all of a sudden everyone wanted this type of supplement. You know, it's really hard. Well, you know, unplanned uh, increases in utilization are really hard to predict, and almost no one ever gets them right. But moving into the cloud allows you to quickly adopt to those changes. And this also allowed them to take advantage of disposable computing, reduce the pain point of support, uh, easy project, you know, clear uh, motivation, outcome, um, justification. So with that, before we get to regular kind of q and A, I I want to talk about the other side of this. You know, we went through, ideally, this is a process that you can go through and have those cross-functional discussions and, and reach agreements. Um, sometimes someone just says, uh, we just need this done. So 
the conversation could get changed very quickly uh, to something like. OK. Let's break it up into three phases then. Uh, because there is a time requirement, whatever the reason is, and you can say phase one. Let's just get into into the cloud. Because of whatever the motivation is, the motivations are usually easy to figure out. Um, Phase two of the project, not tied to this first one, let's start refactoring parts of it, not the whole thing, but maybe we can take advantage of some of those services in the cloud to uh, to get this running, to reduce the cost, to improve performance. You know, other than just moving tons of VMs and just replicating exactly what you had, but there'll be cases where they just they just want it in the cloud. They don't want to deal with any other thing right now, so you're going to replicate it almost one for one and just get it into the cloud. So that kind of solves some stuff with infrastructure, but that can be a phase one. Phase two, do some refactoring. Uh, maybe just switch over to Azure SQL. Maybe take advantage of a CDN. Uh, maybe it's monitoring. There's something you can do to kind of refactor on how things were currently done. Phase three, uh, if and when they're willing to have that conversation, that can be when you look at re-architecting. Because um, we've all seen solutions built not just five years ago, sometimes 10, sometimes 15, and they've just kind of been updating it and everyone's afraid to touch it. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, if the solution's going to continue to be viable, it's at some point going to need a re-architecture. Kubernetes, microservices, doesn't matter. They're excellent uh, solutions that will solve a lot of problems, but that that costs. It's resource of intensive time and money. So if you can't go through all of these and have kind of a very formal approach to it, you can just say phase one, phase two, and later if we ever have the appetite for it, phase three. All right, so uh, with that, um, questions, comments? So uh, your projects now, you, you're not really doing this kind of migration stuff, true? Correct. Um, yeah, no, with uh, with my uh, with SEIC involved in a lot of interesting federal uh, uh, projects um, can't go into details on what they are, but sure. you know, doing work with uh, the uh, Pentagon, with NASA, with the Air Force, uh, with the Army, with TSA, uh, it's very interesting, uh, very challenging. Um, you know, very excited to uh, to be working in the Azure space and you know, being able to participate in these. Uh, right. And these kinds of projects, SAIC is, uh, I think they're about 33,000 yeah. uh, folks. So they're not Big. small. They're not, you know, 100,000 people, but, you know, 33,000, give or take. It's a big company, yeah. Still very big, yeah. Any questions, anybody? And before SEIC and before uh, City, City National Bank, at uh, Champion Solutions Group, uh, where I ran the Azure practice, a lot of mid-sized organizations. Uh, a lot were either in healthcare or in the uh, in the financial spaces. So, saw a lot of different kinds of Azure projects. It was interesting to see how the conversations changed uh, over the years about, you know. If you go back far enough, it was, well, should we go to the cloud? Can we trust the cloud? Is it secure? Um, and now I think most people, majority would agree that, you know, you're going to get far better security and compliance by moving into the cloud and just partnering, you know, with Microsoft and Azure. Uh, think of it really as a, as a partnership and you can take advantage of their you know, vast expertise, employee base, and people who are working toward all these different solutions to make, uh, you know, your lives easier. Uh, 
Yeah, I like it. I like all the platform as a service, like just spin up a little thingy for whatever I need to do. And microservices in general, I guess, but as, yeah, opposed, but, as opposed to dealing with virtual, you know, VMs, so. Yeah, well, with microservices, depending on the solution, you can deploy changes and you don't have to have out uh, change windows anymore. Yeah. You can do rolling changes while the thing is running live. Uh, yeah. So all kinds of advantages. Other questions, comments? No questions for me, but thank you, Jason. And yeah, my in my company, we, we have microservices and we're moving over to Azure. So it was just great just getting an overview with all this. Hey, good to great. see you at a meeting, Natalie. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I was a little multitasking because I was still working. <laughs> but thank you. All right, well, I hope to be uh, back, I think, in a couple weeks. Yeah, you could say, uh, uh, yeah, Azure Active Directory and getting into a lot of security aspects of it be kind of a different presentation. This was more around kind of strategy and planning. Uh, the other will be a more kind of live demo and walkthrough of of those solutions. Yeah, we, we had an internal discussion with the with the leaders and uh, Active Directory seem to come out, Active Directory and security. Yes. So does anybody else on the call have particular topics they would like to see covered? I'm all in for Active Directory. Yeah. Okay, well, when you get me the information, we'll get it posted. We'll, hey, Celia. Hey. Good to see you. Oh, Jason, let me, if you can email me your address, you didn't get a uh, Blazer Roadshow shirt yet, did you? I did not. Okay, because Carl Franklin was going to come down and do a, a roadshow across the country, but it got stopped in Portland because he came down with COVID. Oh, so, okay. uh, so meanwhile, I had uh, four giant boxes of swag. <laughs> so I look at every meeting, I try to give away some. <laughs> so just uh, shoot me your, your mail address and you guys medium large and extra large shirts and a couple of little swag things so speaking well, of shirts i have every single south florida code camp shirt uh, since i think 2009 very good i've so, gotten rid of a, nice. my, my wife just did a, a, a pass through the closet and some of the older code camp shirts went bye bye so yeah, Jason, I got the same collection. <laughs> All right, so it's, at some point we'll have to do a, uh, a South Florida Code Camp fashion show. Yeah. Yeah, a contest. Who has all of them? <laughs> yeah, I don't have all of them, so. <laughs> and I got first dibs. <laughs> all right, well, thank you for inviting me to, right. to speak. It was a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Look forward to uh, chatting with all of you guys again. Thanks a lot, Jason. I'm Thank going to you. stop the recording now. Thank and you. You, you don't Thank mind you. if we post this, do you? No, not at all.